afternoon. Hi, and thank you for joining us today. Um, very grateful to have you all here for what um, is uh, looking like it's shaping up to be a fantastic hour. Um, we've got some brilliant content uh, from some varied speakers, uh, and there's going to be great opportunities for you to ask questions of your own. Um, what we've done here today with Barclays, Barclays Eagle Lab, and Quickfire Digital is put together uh, an hour's worth of uh, insights, tips, knowledge, uh, and, and most of all, experience uh, from, from the attendees on our call today to provide you uh, with some knowledge um, and some ideas and some opportunities for you to move forward with your businesses. Um, the topics discussed, I just need to get the disclaimer in, the topics discussed are an overview of opinions for you to think about to help you with your independent research and business decisions. So aren't intended as recommendations or advice. Remember that as that as well as your business has its own circumstances, the statements and views expressed may not be applicable or suitable to your business. So uh, I've, now that I've said that, um, I don't want everyone to turn off, <laughs> but I need to be really clear. Um, there's gonna be a varied amount of content um, and I think you're going to find it very, very enjoyable. There is something called VBOX, uh, which is a format for you to be able to ask questions. Um, there, is a, there is a code that you're able to, to put in and then your questions will come up via VBOX. So um, that's listed for you to the right of your screen. Uh, if anybody has any issues with that uh, or asks us some further questions, please just pop it into the chat. So without further ado, um, I'm just going to confirm that I'm Richard Pearce. I'm the Business Development Manager for Barclays in Eastern Region. I'm very grateful for you joining us here today. And I'm going to hand over to Nathan Lomax of Quickfire Digital to take us through this future of the high street. Thank you, Nathan. Rich, thank you so much for your help in putting together this event. And thank you to all the Barclays team for making today possible. Good afternoon, everyone. And what an amazing turnout. Thank you so much for taking the time out to join us on today's event. Now, I'd like you to get ready to hear from some, some fantastic speakers. And please do stay on to listen at the end as we go into a fireside chat where we'll be joined by some experts in the world of retail and technology. Firstly, a little bit about myself. I'm Nathan Lomax, co-founder of Quickfire Digital, an e-commerce agency specializing in delivering efficiency, profitability and scalability through the use of tech. Today, I'm delighted to welcome some very special speakers who will be giving you a peek into what's possible right now and how technology is going to breathe new life in the high streets as we open up our doors in the coming weeks and months ahead. Firstly, you'll be hearing from Tom Dale. After graduating from Cardiff University studying urban design and planning, Tom set up TD360, a 360 degree virtual tour agency. Tom's background is in art and design and has moduled TD360 into a design led business that aims to capture and portray spaces in their best light virtually. Tom is inspired by continually pushing the limits of virtual tours, and we're really excited to have him today. After Tom has finished, we'll then be joined by Matt Martin, co-founder of the award-winning Immersive VR, a creative technology studio specializing in virtual reality, augmented reality, and 360 degree video. Now this session is all about bringing products to life, both in-store and online. And we know that by doing this, it's proven to generate sales. And I'm super excited to hear what these guys have been doing and what they're going to be bringing to us. Today, I woke up to the sad news that John Lewis said they're going to shut down even more stores. So now is the time to get ahead and make sure we're doing everything we can to really push forward as our doors reopen. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Tom Dale to kick us off. Tom, over to you. Thanks very much, Nathan. Um, so at university, I actually studied the future of the high street for a module. And in preparation for today, I revisited an SIR rate called Our Modern Consumption Practices Rendering Physical Retail Space Redundant. To summarize the essay and all the resources I looked at during the module, I concluded that no, modern consumption practices are not rendering physical retail space redundant. And I quote from that essay, whilst the increase of online retail sales in comparison to physical stores may be the case for a larger number of businesses, these businesses are increasingly recognizing that the holistic combination of online and offline environments is the most beneficial economically with the modern consumption practices of today. Basically, what I was saying was you want to combine the online world with the offline world as much as possible. 
Anyway, studying this module was a major reason why I set up my business because I could really see the benefits of having a digital twin version of a physical space online. Um, so to jump straight into something visual, let me pull up here a recent project of a, um, a chain of gym bars. Ooh, sorry, let's figure out how to share this. Um, a chain of gym bars in the west of England and Wales. So as you can see here, the clients wanted to portray the bars um, in the environment where it is in the evenings, which is a nice and dark, moody atmosphere. But they also wanted to show what it was like in the daytime too. So by clicking on the bottom here, you can actually see the difference between daytime and nighttime. Um, being able to switch between the two is really beneficial because it means that potential customers um, um, can know exactly what it's like for the time that they want to visit. Um, we've also got uh, gin on display here. And as you can see, there's little icons. So you can click on those icons and a image of the gin pops up and a little bit of information. And then also there's a purchase button. So we've effectively got um, our virtual tour doubling up as a kind of virtual shop as well. So imagine you're a potential customer and you're browsing the internet, trying to find a nice place to take a date. Having this to look through is really gonna increase your confidence because you're gonna know exactly what to expect. And ultimately it's gonna mean that you're mean that you're more likely to book here as opposed to somewhere where you can't look around and that you're not 100% sure about. The reason of course why physical retail space is gonna stay around is because you can't beat being somewhere in real life and having that experience. And I personally believe if you're on the high street, you're not just in the game of selling goods, you've got to sell that experience as well. So virtual tours are definitely one way in which you can sell and promote the experience and give people an idea of what it's like um, to come to your physical store. I'm gonna show you another example now, but before that, I'm gonna tell you a little story. So when I was 18, I had a gap year um, before I went to university. And in the start of that year, I started a clothing brand and sold orig uh, originally t-shirts I hand printed online. By the second half of the year, I was selling out of a physical shop. Uh, it was just a small space on the outskirts of the town where I lived. Anyway, so I had my website where I sold my clothes and I have my physical shop too. And for the record, looking back, there was absolutely no integration of the two. For some reason, I kept them very separate. So someone buying from the shop uh, might have no idea I sell online and someone buying online would have no idea that I have a shop. If I were to know then what I would learn in a few years at university about omni-channel retail ecosystems, I would have definitely done things very differently. But there was one thing that I always thought, and that was I've got my physical shop and I've got my online shop. How come 30% of people that come in my physical shop would buy something, but the conversion rate of my online store was only 3%. So anyway, fast forward until after university, when I set up TV360, my 360 degree virtual tour business, and my first client was my other business, my clothing brand. Um, and it was a bit of a concept project and a bit of an experiment, honestly. But the thought process was, what if we could make a digital version of my physical shop so people could move, look around and buy things from there? So bear in mind, this was my first official project. But let me pull up my, um, my shop here. Okay, so as you can see, we've got the clothes all on the wall here. You can move around by clicking on the logo and then to um, see the, the hoodie, for example, in more detail, you can see a picture, see there, and then you can go through to the e-commerce store where you can make the purchase too. We've also got an about section, so you can learn, out more, learn a bit more about the brand, a lookbook, so you can flick through some photos. And then on here, we've got a, a screen um, playing some videos and that screen is actually Photoshop. There's usually a, a big old window there. Um, and actually even out of these windows, that's the New York skyline, uh, not the original view out of that window. Now the beauty of virtual tours for something like this is it's a chance to let people experience your products in a more natural environment. And there's actually a lot of potential to enhance the storytelling behind the brand and products by embedding images, audio, video as you saw there and text also to tell a much richer story. Also geography is of course no longer an issue and for the first time ever 
anyone across the whole country, anyone across the world could come and visit my shop, which I thought was pretty cool. Okay, so I think I've covered for the most part the idea of capturing your physical space and having a digital version of it online. But what if we wanted to have a completely fictitious shop in the high street, or at least a virtual extension of your shop? This is an idea I'm currently undertaking with a high street uh, gallery owner. Effectively, we're creating a virtual extension of her physical gallery, so there'll be a room which you can access online. The great thing about this room is, just like the real gallery, um, the art will change as the exhibitions change, but the beauty of the online version is you can keep those old exhibitions still there in perpetuity. So those old exhibitions um, can be there forever, unlike in real life, where obviously they've gone as the art changes. As we talked about, there's uh, no limitations to geography, and there's also no limitations to the number of people that can then visit that gallery as well. The artist can also promote this space to their audience online, and bam, sure enough, you've got that perfect integration of your online and offline environments. I unfortunately can't show you that project now, but what I can show you is a virtual gallery I created for myself. Um, so I like to paint. Uh, in my spare time too. Um, and I kind of consider myself an artist. So I recently thought, hey, I've been making these virtual galleries for different artists. Why don't I make one for myself? <clears throat> so welcome to my uh, virtual gallery slash studio on the virtual high street. As you can see, you can view all my canvases there and then to view them bigger, you can click on them, see the title. <clears throat> I also paint on denim jackets, so I wanted to include that. So here you can click on those, click through them and have a look too. Um, got some music in the background. And I also do a bit of tape art, so I tape on walls and on the ground and stuff like that. So I've put that on the wall, but also to integrate a video as well to see how that was made, you can watch this. <clears throat> and this is me making the project. So effectively, this project was a bit of fun, just something for myself, um, intermin intermingled with other clients' projects. Um, but I just, yeah, wanted to share that with you. Cool. So I think I'm going to leave it there for my talk today. I definitely wanted to keep things visual as opposed to giving you loads of stats and figures uh, why this stuff's great. But get in touch if you want to find out more information. And uh, really looking forward to hear the other presentations. Tom, massive, massive thank you. And a really well done. I understand that doing this thing is is sometimes particularly difficult for those that don't know tom's in his early 20s he's a real kind of shining light on the entrepreneurial scene in in north norfolk and we're really excited to be doing some work with tom but great job mate and thank you so much now Good. the next person i'm going to come to is matt martin and matt is slightly further on in his journey but all the same is still a, a really well respected entrepreneur within east anglia and someone i'm delighted to have with us today before i come to you matt just a reminder for people to please keep sending their questions in via VVox. We'll be doing a Q&A with our panel uh, later. And just as a heads up for those that we've got on the panel, we've got Juliana from Superpass, we've got Jamie Miners from Miners and Brady, and we've got Michael Harrison from Gravity. So a really cracking bunch uh, on our panel later where we'll be able to ask them uh, all sorts of questions. So do keep them coming in. However, for now, it leaves me to hand over to you, Matt, for the second presentation. And thanks again, Tom. Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, Tom. Um, yep, so my name's Matthew Martin. I'm a co-founder and the managing director of Immersive VR Limited. We're a, a creative technology studio based in Norwich. Um, I started my entrepreneurial career in retail. I set up a clothing store back in 2001. Uh, it only lasted for about two years. I don't think Lowestoft was quite ready for the radical streetwear style that I, I bought into the town. Um, and also a, a very well-known brand called Superdry popped up not long after um, and uh, kind of destroyed my business, but we won't go there. I've moved onwards and upwards since then um, into creative technology. Uh, I've been doing this now for the last six years, um, co-founded the, the business back in early 2015 with my business partner, James. Um, and we're a, a business that focuses on fully interactive virtual reality, um, augmented reality and 360 degree video. 
I'll jump in and share my screen for you now and run through a, a presentation. So I'm hoping, hoping you guys can see the screen. Can someone confirm that you can see it? Because I can't not, see you anymore. Not yet, Matt. Okay, fine. Just while you're working on that, Matt, I would say that this is the whole reason we're doing these kind of presentations is to show people that there is actually so much excitement for the future of the high street. And, and we're kind of bombarded, right, with news and views and press and social media about how the, the future of the high street is doomed and actually e-commerce will never be the same again. But actually, there is a massive opportunity if you're prepared to embrace change, embrace technology and think outside the box. And hopefully this session will show you exactly that, that if you are prepared to think outside the box, if you are prepared to change, then some fantastic things are possible. And here is Matt. There we go. It's working okay now, yep? Yes, thank you. You can see it, brilliant. Okay, so as I mentioned, we, uh, we, we set the business up back in early 2015. Um, and with regards to creative technology and, and VR specifically, actually makes us dinosaurs in the industry, um, at least in, in this round of VR, which is uh, available to people now. Um, we have a team of 18 employees full-time based in the city. And to date, we've delivered over 100 successful projects. We are not industry or sector specific. We work with, well, as you can see here, a huge array of brands from Premier League football teams through to retail outlets, uh, through to banking and finance, um, engineering. We've done things around recycling plants. We've done things around car launches. So very, very varied. Um, but we take a brief from a client. We work out which is the best technology to use to deliver whatever, is, whatever it is they're trying to uh, achieve. And often these are using very exciting, uh, exciting pieces of technology such as VR, AR, 360 video. It might be interactive touch screens. And a lot of these link in with, with online um, data as well. So I'm going to get into kind of the future of the high street and looking at why currently online is winning and then why our technologies that we work with can help to push it back the other way. When people think about online shopping, they often think about the convenience side of it. Well, I can place an order today and it will arrive on my doorstep tomorrow and I don't need to leave my house to get that product, which obviously is, is something as well that I considered until I started to do a bit more research into this talk. And um, actually, when you think about it, there's a lot more involved in why an online shopping experience can be perceived as more beneficial than walking into a physical retail space. I've listed out some of the things here that spring to mind. And if you look at it, it's all around data rich content. So content is king, as everybody knows. And the more you can find out about a product, the better it is. So if we look at product descriptions, for example, you jump on Amazon or any online website, and you have lots and lots of information and that retailer is able to list out as much info about that product as they like keywords are in there they can they can sell it in multiple different ways to the person that's viewing um you don't get that in store you can see the same product on a shelf and it's literally just the product and the only product description lives on the packaging itself reviews are key um i looked at the uh looked up some statistics yesterday and there are certain products on Amazon that are now over the 35 and even 40,000 positive review marks, which again is validation that a product is good. You don't get that if you go into store generally. Um, extra images, product videos showing how they work. This stuff is all there online, but we don't see it in the physical space. So we've been working on some projects recently, uh, bringing this stuff to life in, in the physical world. A lot of it can be done simply using what's considered now quite old tech like QR codes, display a QR code on the packaging or a QR code on the price tag next to the product. And you can bring up a wealth of information through a web link, um, which can then create that interactive feature. Um, whether people will be happy to stand in store and be flicking through online, that's, that's to be seen. And we're going to be um, rolling this out and, and trialing this in some places over the next few months jump through to the next one. We are contacted by a lot of retailers directly, but also a lot of PR agencies and other creative agencies that represent brands um, with a, a question around how they can make the customer experience in store a lot more exciting. 
this term retailtainment has come up and it's uh, it's basically bringing stores to life with experiential activity in order to drive additional footfall but to also allow people to have more fun when they're in a space and interact with a project a kind of a try before you buy or learn more about the story of a product um, in order to uh, get that connection with it before you purchase i've listed out some good examples where this has been done today across retail the first one was a fun one by Virgin Holidays and actually had this in the Norwich store for a while. Um, you can sit in kind of roller coaster type chairs, uh, put on a headset and go on safari. You can go on roller coasters that go through exotic travel destinations. And it's just a way of being able to allow people to kind of consume some content, feel that engagement, learn more about a destination um, in a more engaging way than sitting with a, an agent who will be showing you imagery in a brochure. This was a project that we actually undertook um, in partnership with another agency for Mazda, Mazda with the end client. Um, they were launching the new MX-5 and wanted to bring it to life in a kind of a, a virtual test drive, although you don't get to physically move the car around, uh, but you get the feeling of, of driving um, through the, uh, the, the mountains of, of Italy in this particular project, which was nice for our crew to go out and capture. Um, and it was delivered in a pop-up um, a pop-up kind of shipping container that was toured around Europe. Um, we decided to take the footage slightly further and have an aspirational feel to it. So rather than it just being a, you put on a headset, you see the interior of a car and it looks as if you're driving around the countryside because you don't get the feeling of driving a real car. And obviously it's important to test drive a real car for real if you're going to spend you know 20 25000 on a, on a car for example so we decided to take it a little bit more sci-fi and you started off in the real world before going down and you can see on this image here a very colorful tunnel as you went through it was all uh, kind of very stylized and it gave people a bit of a wow moment when they came out and made use of the surround sound within the car as well we had 4D um features such as fans that would blow air as, as you go around corners and rumble packs on the seats to give you the, the vibration uh, to give you more of a, a feeling of, of actually driving for real. Uh, Zara decided, um, which was a really nice idea, um, to turn one of their shop windows into an augmented reality display. So they got away, uh, they, they took away all of the traditional mannequins and then placed augmented reality mannequins in the window that were animated or video. Um, benefits to the customer are that you get to in, interact and uh, you know enjoy something engaging. The benefit to Zara is that they'll invest into the application itself, but you have a fixed size piece of real estate there. If you've got mannequins, then of course you've got one outfit per mannequin. With an augmented reality version, you can flip through and change those outfits and have as many different looks and styles. And of course, this kind of thing could be made dynamic. So if you know a little bit about your customers, when they look at the window, if you know it's me, for example, a 40 year old male that likes certain things, you could display the, the kind of style that I would like in the window display. So everyone receives that unique experience in a kind of a dynamic advertising way, which you would you would get online and, and people are used to. Uh, Topshop did a, a really fun um, summer activation. So they had this um, water slide put in and you would go through this, through the store and through this tropical paradise. Um, uh, and, and it was just a, an engaging way of launching the summer range, very, very popular. Um, and they had some physical objects within the store as well to bring the whole thing to life. But it was again about turning the store into an experience rather than just a clothing store. Nike did something very clever um, using projection mapping fairly recently. This allowed you to customize your store in the, in, uh, sorry, customize your trainers in the London store. Um, and in real time, it would project the design that you're creating on the tablet down onto the trainer right in front of you. So you could really have fun um, expressing yourself and creating something completely unique. And a few of our case studies, I'll just run through very quickly. So, um, so we, we did a project, uh, not last Christmas, but the Christmas before for Harrods in London, an augmented reality app um, for the Kingdom of Christmas campaign. You could tour around the different levels of Harrods and uh, discover these fun and friendly characters that would 
bring presents to you or, or just fly around like the owls or the tiger would walk out from behind a display. Um, it was a real engagement piece. It had around about two and a half thousand downloads in uh, the month leading up to Christmas, which for Harrods was a, a big success um, and a, a bigger number than they were they were actually hoping for. Magic mirror display we did for Grand Vision. So Grand Vision are an optics, um, big optics company based in Europe that uh, they own Vision Express in the UK. This was a test piece. We built uh, a couple of years ago, a touchscreen magic mirror, which would basically work in a similar way to the filters that people are used to using on things like Snapchat. Uh, but it allows you to virtually try on um, different styles of glasses and frames. When you found one that you like, you can take a photo of that and share that um, with friends and family or just store it for yourself. And the idea of this is looking at the, the future of, of these stores is not only is it better for hygiene if you're not trying on pairs of glasses that countless amounts of people previously have been putting on, but also um, it has a streamlined process there. It's getting extra customer data. Um, and uh, also it just adds that extra level of engagement. And for IKEA, we did a very fun project. Um, when they launched their kind of their collection stores, so their smaller footprint stores, they could no longer have the, uh, the the huge array of displays that we all like going in and trying out and test driving all these different types of rooms. Um, they had a much smaller space, so we took over one room, uh, we mapped it out, and then it was an empty box, but you would put on a VR headset and you would be able to customize either a lounge or a kitchen or a bedroom in that one same space, mm -hmm. flick out different bits of furniture. You can wish list things as you go. This is all linked into their EPOS system so that when you'd finished, you could then approach the counter and say, finished with my session, I'd like to order everything that I've, I've added to my wish list there. So it was a, again, a seamless process of doing something between the physical and the digital worlds. And finally, for Doc Martins, um, we wanted to show people why the Made in England boots are at a slightly higher price point than the, the other boots that you can get within the store, which are made in the, in the Far East. And uh, done, uh, did this by going and doing a 360 video uh, tour of their, uh, their shoe factory based in Northamptonshire, um, where you were able to tour around and find out the actual process and the level of detail and craftsmanship that actually goes into the creation of a pair of boots. And this was brought to life and placed as an activation piece uh, within their flagship store in London. So this is, these are ideas that you can do and things that we can look at to improve the high street experience. Um, but there's a lot of empty space out there at the moment. And just as a, an, an end point, I um, just want to show you something that we're working on at the moment, um, which is making use of empty retail, because ideally we'd want the high street to come back to life again. We'd want uh, more independent stores to be popping up, but that's going to take time. Um, so while these empty spaces are there, so a lot of landlords that are looking at utilizing the space in different ways. Um, Castle Quarter in Norwich, for example, has done a very good job of taking one of the wings, which was traditionally retail, and turning it into a leisure outlet. Whereas there are lots of smaller independent spaces that can make use of this same, uh, this same process. Um, we're launching, or about to launch, a new brand called Unknown, which is a multiplayer free roam virtual reality experience. So groups of up to six people book together, they go into what looks like a very cool pop-up that can sit and live within an empty retail unit or existing leisure space. Um, and you go in together, you experience a 20 to 25 minute gaming experience, um, lots of different things. It's not all about shooting zombies. There's some less crazy, less uh, violent things out there that you can do as well. Um, but you, it's, it's again, it's about utilizing space, driving footfall into the high street. So if you've got an empty unit sitting there, put something exciting like this in there to attract additional people into the high street. And while they're there, hopefully they'll spend money in the bars, the cafes and the other shops that are, that are there as well. And that's me. So I'm going to jump out of here and stop sharing so I can return to, to see you guys. Um, hope that was useful. Um, I'm going to pass back to Nathan now. And uh, again, thank you to Barclays for inviting me to speak today. Thank you very much, Matt. A massive thank you. It's so nice to see not only the future of the high street and where this can go, and there's so many different ways and we can take it. So there absolutely is so much hope 
um, for the high street, but actually to see how much creative talent we've got here in East Anglia as well. Now, I'm going to jump straight into the Q&A because actually a lot of you may have some burning questions that have arisen from those sessions or actually perhaps you've come today with your questions. Before I dive in, just a quick introduction to the panel. We have Jamie Miners, uh, MJ Miners and Brady. We've got Juliana, CEO at Superpass, and we've got Michael Harrison, uh, COO and co-founder of Gravity Active Entertainment. A fantastic panel for us all to ask our questions to today. We've had a few questions come in before, so I'll start with them. However, I'll try and get through as many as I possibly can, and I'll just ask the panel randomly to answer so we can get through as many as possible. And so let's get this started. The first question is going to come to you, Jamie, and it's why we're really all here today. How do you feel about the future of the high street? Obviously, in the estate agency business, a slightly different vertical, but still very much a core pillar of the high street. How are you feeling about uh, us opening our doors again in the coming weeks? Well, for our business, Nathan, our industry has been very well protected overall. But obviously, some agents have unfortunately felt the sort of tough part of what's happened. I think going back to the, the high street, there's good opportunity for people. and There's great excitement for businesses that want to evolve. Um, agreeing with what Matt said earlier in his presentation, which was fantastic, it is going to be more experience based and it does need to evolve from just buying as a commodity. So if you're going to a high street and you're picking up a product and you're only buying that and walking out, that there's no extra experience to that. And for me, you might as well just buy it online. Whereas if there is an experience to what you're doing and there's value to it, I think this gives loads of opportunity to many businesses, big and small, to actually evolve in the high street space. And I think it's needed. And I think it's going to be a really exciting time in the next three to five years. Jamie, thank you. Julian, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, the phrase omni-channel is being used a lot at the moment. And today we're talking specifically about technology. How do you think online and offline should work together so that they can complement each other? Hi, everyone. So, um, well, it, it, it's a brilliant question. And I just wanted to say thanks so much to these incredible presentations that we've seen today. And I think that encompassed in them is, is just perfect examples to actually answer this question. And, and the answer being that now with every so much being online and people still want a physical experience. And I think that the future is going to be a convergence where businesses have to have both you know, they have to have an online presence. They have to really work out how they can deliver that growth. And, and actually the the the, um, the 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 Cox's story in Sudbury was brilliant because he still got his physical market business as well, but he's got the online business and the two working together work so well. And um, I, it's been said by a few people today and I, I know Matt said it and um, Jamie's just said it as well about that when people go to the high street, it's not, they're not just going to buy something or at least in the past they may have, but in the future, that's not going to be why they're going. They're going for the experience. We are, as people, we're social. You know, there's there's only so much so socialising we can all do online. And there's something about being in a physical space. So shops that have a coffee area where people can actually meet and have cake together and, and laugh. And, you know, that is something you can't replace with online. Having those incredible, um, like Castle Mall is a great experience in Norwich at the moment. They've got a few of their empty shops. They put other experiences in there like games and, and other things just to bring people in. And I think that's what you can't replace online. You you can Online, you can buy the product. That is very easy to do online. And actually, well, for me personally, I've been doing online shopping for 10 years. I, I don't ever go shopping in town, which I'm probably a bad example on this panel. Or maybe that's a perfect example. But the reason why people want to actually go to meet each other is to see each other, to have a physical experience that is like the, the Nike one was was great as well that, that the match showed where they could also see in like 3D round the trainer. So an image on the screen is still 2D, whereas actually being able to see the way the colors go round the rest of the shoe and stuff that you can't replace that. Um, so, yeah, so, so so much we could say. But um, I think I think for businesses that are have physical presence, if they're looking to do something online and I guess this is where we at Superpass we specialize is what how can businesses really transition online to be able to create something that is meaningful it's all about community and content and being able to so for example if you're a toy shop instead of just selling toy products actually a lot of parents want to know well you know what games could I make with this how could I use this as education for my kids so if you had videos that actually teach kids how you know parents you know that that kind of not we're in a knowledge industry so actually what we see a lot of experts actually creating knowledge-based content that then can drive the, the products 
that kind of um, in convergence of digital content, physical products, whether that physical product is bought in a store or not doesn't really matter if you're bringing all of that together. I think that's very exciting. Thank you, Juliana. Michael, I'm going to come to you. Before I do, I'm just going to set some ground rules for this Q&A because we've got some questions coming in. If I just raise my hand, this is me very politely telling you that your time is up. I want to get through as many of these as possible. So we'll do some quick fire questions. But Michael, this one seems particularly fitting to yourself and that's innovation is built into the DNA of the online world. And we've heard today some of the fantastic tech possibilities. How do you think that innovation can be translated to the high street shopping experience? Hi. Uh, well, look, I, I know it's very easy to feel very doom and gloom about the high street at the moment, but we need to be clear here. The high street isn't dead. And what what is out there is a physical experience that people want and need. And I think personally for too long, retailers have, have pretty much opened the shutters, especially in big shopping centres and, and on, the high, on, the, on the major high street, and going, okay, where's the customers? And people need to think outside the box. Tech is going to be a huge part of what happens moving forward, but the high street needs to change. Big shopping centers, big department stores, they've become old fashioned. You know, I'm in the process, I've just taken a 100, 110,000 square foot unit on Wandsworth High Street, a Debenham store, and that will be a multi-use leisure facility. And that, Footfall will increase on that shopping centre between 40 and 50% because of the leisure opportunity that's going to happen in there. At that point, it's our job to, to get the parents to have the children with something to do and say, go and have some fun, leave us alone while we walk around the shops. And at the same time, you know, I'm, real, I'm realistic. We're, the opportunities that are coming to gravity right now all over the world, not just the UK, uh, are there because there is too much of the same retail. And what I aim to do over the next two to three years is, is link retail and leisure in the way that, for instance, people will, will come and play, create their avatar online, and whether it's bowling or karting or, or trampolining, all these scores will link together. And what they will be able to do with these, these scores is win prizes that they can then go and spend on the retail stores. We already partner up with lots of F&B operators where, you know, they get on the wristbands and the receipts, they get discounts in restaurants around the mall. Because it would be very easy for me to look, look as, a, as an individual entity and say, no, no, we'll put the food on. We'll take all this money here. But it's not about us. It's about the shopping centre as, as a whole. And... Leisure is going to be a major part of retail and people need to stop looking at this as, as their opportunity to do well. They've got to look at these centres and towns and uh, as a community and how do we get people to come to this community and work together a lot more. So I think things are pretty rosy. It's not all doom and gloom. It's just a change of the guard. And that's exactly today's theme, Michael, and thank you for that. And it's so exciting to hear of what's going on with gravity, etc. But yeah, for those that are unsure, there is so much to look forward to. Seeing as this is co-hosted by Quickfire, we're going to go into some Quickfire questions. Jamie, I'm going to start with you. And this one's about culture and kind of customer service. Now, I know the Miners and Brady team particularly pride themselves on customer service. And a lot of these arguments are actually retail's really got to up its game when it comes to customer service. What are your thoughts on this? Hmm. When I first went into oh, my office, when I took over the lease in 2014, I was 22 years old and the shop next door said to me, whatever you do, young lad, don't come in here. You've got no chance. The whole housing industry is going online. I wouldn't even bother. And that's what the lady next door said to me in the shop that, you know, I won't mention, but that, that, it all stuck in my brain. And for us, giving an experience to people, making sure they feel loved and valued and they actually gain something out of us having a presence uh, that that for us meant that we survived as a business. So, um, yeah, ha having experience, having a feeling, we're all emotive creatures, whether we're buying, selling, getting a service, whatever it may be, we're all controlled by emotions. So, um, yeah, I, I, I massively, massively agree with Michael and with Juliana and the rest of the guys and girls as well. It's all about experience base and there is a changing of the guard hugely. 
Jamie, thank you. Uh, Julia, I'm going to come back to you. And this is around, we have a generation growing up with the ASOSs, the Boohoos, the Blakely Clothings, the Gym Sharks. What will shops need to do to compete with or work alongside these typically online focused brands? So I think a lot of it's been covered today. I think, I mean, if it's clothes, then there is definitely something in actually being able to touch it and feel the material. You know, I speak to people where they say that that's so important to them. And, and yes, with, with the purely online stores, you can buy a whole bunch of clothes and then send back the ones that you you don't want. But it's it's different to that experience of just walking around a shop and just letting it all kind of wash around you. And you don't really get that online. So I think there'll always be a place for like and something like shoes you know you really want to actually like try on the shoe walk around the shop there, there's certain things that are just better in person um but i think a lot of shopping is going to be online you know i don't think that i think companies that try and fight that are basically going to lose i think what michael said is really really interesting about creating that experience it's a leisure experience that's really where this is going because that's something you can't replace online so instead of um these big retailers thinking okay well i my, I'm directly competing with selling this T-shirt with an online, you know, selling the T-shirt. That's not what you're competing with. Look at what is it that you can deliver in store that can't be done online. And that's where you're going to win and really building out those experiences. And and yes, you can also have the products there, too, because obviously, you know, that's where, where you're making your money. But the reason of bringing people in and increasing that footfall is going to be different. And it is through experiences. It is through that community and and, and meeting other people. Thank you. Uh, Michael, I'm going to come to you. And that's that big chains have arguably made many high streets look identical. Is there an opportunity to bring the character back? Obviously, we're talking about entertainment and leisure facilities doing that. But how else do we think we can really bring personality back to the high street? The high street is going to go for a huge change. And, and, and look, I'm trying to create now... Uh, a high-end coffee shop to, to sit not just alongside what we're doing as, as an operation, but, but also as a standalone. And I, I look at what Starbucks are, I look at what Costa are, and they've just sort of took the whole market and they don't even care what they serve anymore. And we keep going in there like sheep and we get the same coffee with the same milk and we drink it and we pay over the odds for it. And, and look, the, the days of, of, of towns being unique, we seem to have lost along the way some, somewhere. And and what what happened was it was only the big guys that could afford the rates and the rents. That's all coming to, a, to an end. And how many of us here now actually look beyond the typical coster and think, actually, look at the work gone into an artisan cup of coffee that someone's took time to work and, and taste. It's coming back. And the high street's going to change. I, I believe people are going to start living in the town centres more and 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 it's now the, the conglomerates are it's coming to an end. They've had it all their own way. And I think people are waking up to it's not sustainable long term. And now it, it, the landlords can't demand the rents they once could. Change is coming. And 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 the typical example of that is the fact that on Wands of High Street, an area that I would never dream of being able to afford 120,000 square foot of space or 110,000 square foot of space right in the high street now is going to be an indoor multi-level car interact with bowling alley two restaurants two bars uh interactive darts golf. it's never happened before and people will literally walk up on that site and go wow this isn't anywhere else and and that's my point i'm not saying gravity or leisure's the answer to to everything but what isn't are are 30,000 square foot shops, which all the clothes come from the same factory. And, and, and we, 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 we've, we've not been given enough choice and we've, we've been almost bullied into it as consumers. And it's, it's coming to an end. Thank you. This is a question to all the panel and I'll start with you, Jamie, and cycle round. But there are a number of stakeholders involved in this process of rejuvenating the high street and moving forward with technology. How do we think we can get town planners and local councils and shop owners and landlords and customers to all really buy into this revival of the high street? And that doesn't matter if you're in the estate agency world or you're in kind of the, the high street retail or you're in something totally different. How do we get everyone to buy into this? I had this debate the other day and I keep having this debate with many people. 
it has to stem from two parts and one has to be from from government and other funding which has to uh, mirror something similar to what matt said earlier in his presentation which is create something interesting to pull crowds in so we need to actually invest in in something or some things regularly to pull crowds into uh, a city or an area uh, and from there i mean uh, rates are so expensive rates need to be looked at we're paying silly money for our rates for our premises um the businesses need better help to be able to have funding to be able to go in and actually try and you know take some of these premises over uh and you know echoing what michael said about you know creating something that isn't there already um at the moment we've got too much commodity too much going in it's the same old clothes and the same old products and the same old faces um, so I think the government need to pull it, pull out some some funding to try and help create, uh, and perhaps some local business people need to get together in each area to try and create some some better ideas and and pay for some attractions, pay for something that actually does pull people in. I love the idea, Matt, of the the driving experience with you know driving cars, and obviously Michael, the idea of kids being able to come in and, and earn vouchers for you know for, for shopping, fantastic ideas. Um, but right now nobody is actually there pulling all this together. The government perhaps don't want to invest money and the private businesses are cautious on where they spend their money. So it, something needs to change radically to try and um, try and speed this up. Juliana, in terms of driving change, what are your thoughts? How are we going to get people to take action? Because that's the focus of today. It's all well and good listening to the thoughts and seeing all the opportunities. But now, as I like to coin the term, pulling the trigger, we now need to go and do something about it. How can we drive forward that change? So I, I actually would like to comment on the question you asked Jamie as yeah, well. Sure. What we've got at the moment is this huge opportunity to to actually let that change happen. And I would like to start every um, everything with with why. Why is it? Why are we here talking about the future of the high street? Why is the high street important? And actually, it's important because of supporting local businesses. And actually, supporting local businesses doesn't necessarily have to be in the way that the traditional high street has always been. I think what Ellis has shown us all today is, is incredible because that ability to have a virtual high street where local businesses can be supported and, and the massive opportunity that I think we have here, it ties in with a huge government incentive that, that there is for net zero. You know, In the next 10 years as a country, we want to get to net zero. And that means there's gonna be huge change in every part of um, of, of business and also we're in the situation where we've got the pandemic which has already created this huge change so we're in the situation where things are moving online we've had this pandemic that's catalyzed this massive change and we're trying to drive to net zero so actually we should be looking at all those things together we should be bringing in what government can do what funding can do what individual consumers can do and i think that question would you source local if it was easy to buy as amazon as amazon and i think I, it would be really cool to know the stats on that of, of how many people would say yes, but I would imagine that a good proportion of people would actually say yes to that if they understood why sourcing local is so important about um, supporting the local economy and local businesses and local jobs, but also about cutting down on the environmental impact of sourcing things from halfway across the world when you could get them from down the road. So change is coming and we should all embrace it. United, thank you. And finally, for you, Michael, in terms of driving forward this change, how do you believe that those listening today that are buoyed by what they've heard, how can they really take their first step into driving change into really making a difference to their local high street? Look, change is coming. Uh, and, and like Juliana said, it, it, it's here. And I've been preaching this for, for six years since I started the business. And it, it was very easy to, to bat us off. It was very easy for, for planning to say no because they had other options. Right now, these options for, for big landlords to just fit within the box and, and, and run these centers on rents and not on personality and, and, and not on, on a different, different experiences. You know, we're going to see major shopping centers with local producing, with local, you know, local shops. And, and this is the people that are going to fill these things and change is coming. I, I went into this pandemic with no debt whatsoever. Um, you know, I've, I've, I've been bankrupt in the past. And I've always been conscious of that. I'll come out of this pandemic with six million pounds worth of debt just through keeping up with, with keeping these sites going. And I still feel fortunate that we live in this country and we've had the support from the government we've got. And for, for the money it's cost me in debt through this pandemic, I believe everything I've been preaching for the last six years, 
it's just been realized and and the opportunities for entrepreneurs and small business wanting to grow the opportunities are way going to out outweigh the crisis we've just been through because when we come out of this it's going to be the roaring 20s Michael, what a lovely way to finish. And I really thank you all to our wonderful guest speakers, to our panellists, but finally to Barclays. I've always said that Barclays are so much more than a traditional high street bank. And here is yet another example of why they are so fantastic. So massive thank you to Richard Pierce, who has helped us pull, together, pull this together. Thank you to Alex Broom that also helped and also to all the Barclays team behind the scenes. I hope you've all enjoyed it. Change is happening. And the first place to start is with yourselves. Connect with these people on LinkedIn make something happen and really do what you can do to make the high street a better place. Rich, I'm going to hand back to you, but finally a massive thank you to all those watching and listening. I hope you've enjoyed it and we look forward to seeing you on the next Future Of series. Thanks again. Thank, thank you. you so much, Nathan. Uh, kind you. words there and I think also a round of applause to Nathan uh, with his expert hosting uh, and really insightful questions. Um, just reading through the V-Box, I can see that this, yes, well done, thank you. Let's, let's give them that physical round of applause as well as a virtual one. So just looking just looking through all the V-Box questions, I can see that how engaged that everybody has been throughout the session. Lots of really interesting comments, um, additional questions that have been asked. Um, part of the reason that we do these types of events at Barclays is, as Nathan mentioned, you know, we like to see each of the towns, each of the communities we serve um, as part of an ecosystem which then feeds into a larger, larger ecosystem. Uh, whilst many of the speakers on this event have been East Anglia based, um, I can see here we've had people commenting from Kent and Manchester and Chester. So it tells me that the content is engaging uh, and could be relevant to the area that you live in. Um, I guess the final thing as well is, is as we start to move through the year, we're looking to, to, to do further events. There will be a future of uh, leisure and tourism, future of hospitality, and a series of ethical events. So anybody that is on, on the event here if you want to get involved at all with any any of your own ideas or concepts please do get in touch um, because without you we can't continue to grow um, it's shown here what we can do with new ideas um, but as a team as collaborative ecosystems we can really make a difference to to our high streets uh, and and the future of this country i'm feeling impassioned by michael's uh, positive outlook uh, despite the debt, that's a really insightful kind of last viewpoint. I think many businesses will be feeling the same at the moment. Um, but um, yeah, I think there's so much more to look forward to. And together, we can move forward as one. Thank you very much today. And Richard, I think I would probably pay quite a lot of money right now as well for a good haircut and a shave. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much. So, 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 